Hey, I'm Mike Nguyen. I'm a um, uh, uh, Vietnamese guy, <laughs> comedian, podcaster, writer, creative uh, asshole. Yeah, there you go. Welcome to the Vietnamese. I'm your host, Kenneth Nguyen. Being part of a culture of nearly 100 million Vietnamese people in the world today comes with a lot of pain, proud history, and privilege. Join me as I highlight and explore the Vietnamese experience from all over. You know, before we even get into my question of what does it mean to be Vietnamese, I want to know, is comedy dead in America to you? Not at all. <laughs> it's undestroyable. <laughs> Tell me about it. Tell me why you think that's, that's so. There is, if I mean, if anything, we're living in a, uh, a new golden age of comedy where there's more comedy now than ever before. There's more specials. There's more types of comedy. There's more content. The way to get content is ever increasing. There's more for people like me. Um, there's more ways to reach fans. There's more ways to express comedy. There's more, there's a greater range of what is what is comedy. There's more people who participate in comedy than ever before. Uh, it's more global than before. It includes more stratuses of society. It's uh, it's if anything, I would argue there's too much comedy. <laughs> there's way too much, way too much comedy. And uh, no, I don't know. But it, yeah, it's the opposite of dead. It is changing um, and it changes fast. But there is more comedy and more and more, more and more of it than ever before. It's good yeah. to hear. That's good. to yeah. hear. You hear a lot of just regular people. You know, I'd go to dinner and people are like, fuck, comedy's dead. And, you no, know, yeah. Yeah, these guys who have such a, a cynical way of, of looking at what the comedy landscape is. But the reality is this just the proliferation of more comedy and it's just catered to different people, right? Right. right. What I would say is uh, those people would, would uh, you know, I think there is an ex ex uh, a belief that there is a certain kind of comedy, which is the main kind, quote unquote, main kind. But, um, you know, I think... Um, because there's more, it feels like that kind of comedy is less important. Uh, I would actually argue it's not that's not true at all. Um, but um, but in either case, there's because there's so much more content, um, there's really something for everyone. And for some reason, um, I, I guess I did this too for a while, but for some reason, when people find out that your comedy isn't the privileged one, and I mean that privilege in the sense that it's like, the one that everyone agreed was the best, they get really upset, you know, when, <laughs> um, when there's a comedy for uh, a really niche, like goth um, uh, punk band, you know, from Portland, and that's comedy, then people are like, well, what about the other kind of comedy that I grew up watching? Isn't the, you know, why are you attacking my, the, my mainstream comedy? And people get really upset about it because their their form of comedy is no longer considered like the pinnacle one um so i think you know people just need to chill and and if if listen you don't have to like every kind of comedy i certainly don't um but i've it's much healthier just to be like hey that's not for me i like this kind of comedy and enjoy your content that you like man you know yeah how long you been at it uh i've been doing stand-up for more gosh i don't know i don't know time doesn't mean anything anymore so I don't know, a hundred years. No, I don't know. Like nine years, probably. Uh, I would say is like, you know, when I started doing stand up. Um, I was a writer before that, and, and not a comedy writer, but just like a creative person for like, you know, ever since uh, my early teen, early twenties, I guess. But yeah, about about nine to ten years for what I would say starting comedy as a career. I can't say career because careers you get paid, but you know that's how it is. <laughs> <laughs> that's a funny distinction but yeah <laughs> don't you think though at nine years even at 12 years sometimes that getting paid is still an uphill battle for most people oh yeah i mean in general i think being a creative person yeah. is um you know it, it's uh the the, uh, the economy we live in like kind of um does its best to make sure creative people don't get paid or valued <laughs> so in general that's true and i think especially for comedy any any kind of career where you have a lot of people who really want it um or you know th that that means that uh there's a lot of people who can take advantage of you and so um you know when there's a scarcity men mentality 
um, you know, a lot of comedians will do things for really inexpensive, you know, like I've done, I've done tons of shows where I lose money, like net lose money, you know, like I have to take a train up to Connecticut and I get paid in like a, a vodka martini, but then, you know, it cost me 40 bucks to go there and back. And then I had to do the subway and then something happened. So, you know, there, it, it's really difficult to do that. I think it's a, it's, it's, it's the industry's fault for kind of taking advantage of essentially artists, what creative, you know, co- comedians are artists. Um, but it takes some, you know, changing of that mindset to like kind of get away from, I'll do anything to do comedy because that, leaves you susceptible to doing literally anything you you know so yeah it's 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 tough and and uh it's already tough enough again being a a creative person but then comedy is like this whole other thing what what do you think keeps you going all these years oh god uh stupidity (laughs) i don't think um i think somebody told me before um if i didn't do this my this kind of affliction would come out in some other way if i yeah. stopped doing comedy i would probably still like do creative shit but i would just be like a really bad photographer or i would be like a, I would be making like really bad t-shirt designs or or like you know writing a history book no one would read or something like that it, it's just like something you you do because you have um it, like a, a part of your brain that you can't turn off for yeah. lack of a better yeah. word right it's just like, it's just uh, you wake up and you automatically start doing it, you know? Uh, for me, it's not even necessarily doing jokes, but it's definitely like storytelling. Like yeah. I, I do, yeah. I've done that since I was a little kid. I pretended I'm in, you know, I'm a pirate or I'm a astronaut or something like that. And I can't turn it off. It's impossible. Even, you know, even, even at my age, it's embarrassing, but you know, it's just how it is, you know? How, how did you get into it? Um, I stopped uh, with, with, with comedy. You, you yeah, yeah. How'd you get into in comedy? comedy? Um, I got laid off from a job. Um, best day of my life. Everyone should get laid off once. It's like the best <laughs> to um, because when you think about it, when you think about getting laid off, what your boss is saying is, hey, you should stop caring about this company. And you're and usually for most people, you're like, I'm way ahead of you, dude. I stopped caring six <laughs> months ago. So this uh, this ad agency laid me off. Um, horrible place. And it was the best. I could drop all the pretense i just i remember i just like stole a bunch of stuff from them put it in my bag and just like walked out of the building and i walked out and i i had a couple of drinks and uh, some of my friends who were still employed at the place they came down and they were nice and they were talking to me about things and um at one of the, at one, you know i was hanging out at the bar and i saw that they had an open mic at this bar across the street in new york city from where i lived so i was like i've always wanted to do stand up and i you know i've 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 i feel i could do it um and so i wrote some jokes and i went the next week and i signed up for comedy uh for to do stand up uh at this open mic and it was a mixed mic which means that they um had all kinds of acts so i followed like the guy before me was like uh you know some strung out cokehead <laughs> musician who played like a 12 minute long song and then the guy after me was like a magician uh, and the magician was great. He was like the best person in the whole show. But uh, I did stand up comedy and it was really scary. And I'm not like I don't have stage fright, but it was terrifying. And like I was doing it to just nobody's. But I was still really scared. Um, and I did it and it was fine. I didn't do good. I, I did pretty bad. Um, but it was really cool to have like something just very crystal at the end of the at end of it right i i wrote jokes and i went and i told them and it that was like more creativity than i had done in like mm. years and years of being alive right i've always had ideas for like oh i'm gonna do a you know like a short story or i'm gonna do a um you know i'm gonna make a a, a film or something like that and i would write these ideas down and nothing would ever happen and it was cool that i got up i told these jokes they were bad but they were i did them and that was really appealing. And I asked one of my friends who was um, really established, uh, much more established in, in comedy. And he pointed me in the right direction. And New York City is the best place to to get a lot of stage time. So, you know, I started doing open mics and doing a bunch of them, as many as I could stand uh, to do a week. And uh, 10 years later, uh, here I am in the dark <laughs> talking to you. <laughs> 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 oh, God. <laughs> 
week. Well, I'm glad you're here sitting in the dark talking to me. This is great. Yeah, man. So did you grow up with people telling you like, you're a good, you're a funny dude? Yes. I did grow up being told I was a funny person. I, I think as a kid, uh, I don't know if you were like this for, you know, because you may, you know, if you grew up in California, I always felt really strange, like with my other classmates. And it wasn't like I was the only Asian kid. There were a lot of other Asian kids. I grew up in California. But there was just something like I felt very, um, I don't know, when I was really young, I was really tall for my age. I was like a really tall fifth grader. Uh, and everybody thought I was going to be tall. But actually, I just grew up to fifth grade and then I stopped. <laughs> I was like five, six when I was in fifth grade. And then like over the course of the next 10 years, I grew up another like another inch. Um, but uh, what's it? Um, I just felt always like kind of like an outsider. Can, can, you, um, can you pinpoint that feeling that can you tell yeah. me what exactly? Because is it a race? Is it you have a small dick, a big dick? <laughs> what, what, no, is, I, what was it? I, I think I just like I just it, it I think I, it it's too easy to say it was just race, but it had a lot to do with that. It had a lot to do with like I just didn't know how to fit in with everybody else. Like I'll give you an example. Like so, I'm also really into clothes. I'm also into fashion, and I was really obsessed even as a little kid about dressing, and I was really obsessed with where do all the white kids find their clothes because my mom you know, God bless her. She, you know, she's just an immigrant mom. She's, uh, you, you know, we would go shop at the mall, but she didn't know where to shop for me. She, She's buying the clothes that's on sale. Right. And so she's just putting me in that. Like I never knew where to get sneakers. You know, this is, it sounds insane, but I just never thought about where to get sneakers and cool sneakers, like the pump. Right. I just wore like whatever sneakers my mom gave me. So that was just an example of like, I never, I just wanted to fit in. Yeah. And I think because I couldn't fit in, I ended up making a lot of jokes in order to break the tension that I had in my mind um, about like either, you know, if people were making fun of me or if if I just felt awkward for myself, I would try to make jokes. Um, and it was something I was like, I could, I could get a rise out of people, you know, even at a relatively young age, like, you know, even as a, as a, like a, excuse me, as a, you know, that's why. Sorry, even as like a sixth grader, I could still, um, you know, get people to laugh. So that was always something I, I kind of cultivated over time. I didn't mind being the center of attention. I mean, I was like a studious kid, but I didn't mind kind of acting like a fool yeah. <laughs> in front of people. So that was uh, something I kind of grew up having, you know, uh, just kind of like trying to observe. I was very observant. And I think a comedian, comedians are very observant. We try to see what's happening what are the what are the dynamics the social dynamics that are happening and how do people behave how do people act and how do people dress um so i was always again very aware of those sorts of things um i will say that it's i think it's unusual for a comedian to be funny in real life right uh, i think i think i'm funnier in real life than i am on stage i'm gonna be <laughs> i just gotta know about myself i'm pretty funny on stage but I'm, i think i'm i'm much funnier in real if you just meet, met me and just talk to me like a person um, but because most comedians are very anxious and they kind of get their creativity out on stage. Whereas I had to do the opposite. I was like, okay, I'm, I'm already funny in real life. How do I convert that into a stage persona? Right. And that for a long time, I was like, I was trying to figure out how do I turn something that I could tell as like a street joke, uh, you know, how could I be funny in a bar and turn that into a funny thought that becomes funny on stage and you know a lot of the process of me doing stand-up is like sounds weird but just like trying to be myself as much as possible mm. you know i think um with stand-up it's like yeah, you are playing a character like it's you know I, I am playing like a heightened version of myself but i also had to learn like what is funny to me and how do i convince other people that that's funny like how do i get people to see through my eyes about how unusual it is that you know we do whatever thing. So that was that was for me in my process. It was it was very much like how do I like make my my worldview and convince other people that that's funny. And, and at what point do you go? You know what? I think I got this. I think I'm going to go full steam. Oh man, I still haven't gotten there, man. You know, <laughs> I'm still I still got a job. I just you know I had my I had I work uh, my my day job. And, and if you're listening day job, thank you for the money and the healthcare and everything's going great. I'm, we'll be quitting comedy soon. Don't worry. 
Um, <laughs> this is this is insane. Um, but no, I I still do that. Do you um, like your day job? I do. I mean, I came to New York to do that. You know, I I was like, uh, you ever watch Mad Men? Is yeah, that, that TV show. I thought I I work I worked in advertising. I guess I kind of still work in advertising, and it's uh, I thought my life was going to be like Don Draper. I'm going to be sitting around drinking whiskey and you know, uh, having, um, uh, you know, like, uh, liaisons and stuff like that. And, and it was an advertising is not like that at all. And now, uh, probably for the better, but, um, that's what I got into doing this. And so like, I'm still interested in, in, in doing it. And there's a lot of, you know, there's still a lot of figuring things out. And when there's, it's a really good day, it can be really creative and really fun. And when it's a bad day, you just, you know, it's just like any other job, but, um, you know, I still, I, I feel like I can't like let go of, you know the 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 grind mentality that I grew up with, right? I I I realized actually I was thinking about it the other day that, geez, since I was probably you know, in my mid twenties, I've always had like more than one job, like I need more than one income stream. You know, I need to have freelance and I do comedy and that that's not very much money. And I have my day job and I, I'll try to scrounge for something else. You know, I, I think it's, you know, I always feel like I need to make more money. So it's it's something for me. I think even if I had like some incredible opportunity, I'd probably still do something on the side, right? You know, I, I could be in a Marvel movie, but then also try to like work Uber Eats or something like that because like I can't trust that money, you know, like you can only trust yourself. So I, I need more money. That sounds uh, like and, some Vietnamese trauma, man. Right? Do you understand? I don't know if you feel Completely like that. Completely understand you know? it. Yeah, totally understand. So what does it mean to be Vietnamese to you? How has it become for you? Oh man, I, that's such a good question. I feel, you know, I feel like, um, and I don't know how how many of your guests feel like this, but like, there's so many times where I'm like, I feel really Vietnamese, and then there's so many times where I'm like, I'm not Vietnamese at all, <laughs> you know, because I don't really speak the language. For example, it's like really poor. Um, I mean, I would say my Spanish is is way better than my Vietnamese, um, and. There's a lot of like, like growing up in in California. You know, I was kind of like I had an arm's length from the Vietnamese culture, and like, and I grew up in in California in the '90s, and so it was very like Rice Rockets and um, what is it called, uh, Fast and the Furious. Like, I grew up Fast and the Furious Part One. That was like my <laughs> teenage years. You know what I'm saying? But I never had like a fancy car like that. I never like dr drove those things. I was never like in a gang. I was just I was like a you know, I was a sensitive kid. I wasn't like a Vietnamese kid, like running around drinking Hennessy and getting into fistfights and stuff like that. So like, there's a lot of times where even now when I'm watching like a Vietnamese TikTok, um, if it's in Vietnamese, forget it. Like I'll like yeah. barely be able to understand, but there's a lot of references I don't really get, especially now with kids, like Vietnamese kids. Now they have all these references. They're like, I kind of get it, but like, I kind of don't. Um, and I think that's, uh, you know, that's like my own experience, right? I'm always trying to like wish I was more Vietnamese, you know, at, at, you know, and um, as a comedian, I think your job is to like represent your culture, to like defend your culture, but then also to like critique your culture as much as possible. For sure. You know, like to call out, like, I mean, I'm the first one to always talk about how, um, you know, there were so many <laughs> Vietnamese people at the, January 6th insurrection because we love coups. We like if you look at the history of Vietnam, we had so many coups, dude. We we just miss coups. We're just like, yo, we heard there's a coup happening. We're, we're there. We're there. <laughs> we're pros so, at that. Yeah. We're pros at coups, you know? Like get, get me yeah, get me uh get me some secret police, man, you know? So Vietnamese, you know, it's like I, I I think my relationship to being Vietnamese is like trying to understand where I fit in again and like you know, like loving everything about it, but also like critiquing it a lot too. Now, when in your mind, you go, I have to do a lot of jobs, you know, and you are grinding and it's like tongue in cheek. But at what point do you feel like you have made it as a comedian? Mm. Gosh, you know, I don't know. I think. Hmm. That's such a good question. I mean, I've, I mean, I've asked you can land a few specials and you can make yeah. a million or two million from shows, but then have you made it in your mind? Right. What's the metric? That's such an interesting. I mean, I definitely have not made millions from my shows, but um, I could see where even if I did, 
there's always either something bigger or you always feel like that's, you know, very transient, right? That's going to go away. Like, um, you know, like I would say the biggest gig I've ever done is like I opened for Ronnie Chang uh, at the Beacon Theater in New York City. And that theater is historic. It's beautiful. Like so many comedians have done that there. I mean, there's like, you know, name every single famous musician. They've performed there and I was there and I performed in front of like whatever, 2,000, 3,000 people. Wait, when was that? That was last year. It was actually right around this time last year. Uh, I performed he was on tour and I got to do his New York thing. And if you listen to the net, his latest Netflix special, the one also from last year, I was his opener for the Netflix recording. And so it's my voice bringing him up. Oh, shit. And, right. You know, and it, it was cool. It was like a really cool thing to do. Ronnie's an awesome guy and he's always looking out for me. And it was great. But like the next day, I still had to go to work, you know, and you know, maybe it'd be different if I made a million dollars that year. Um, but I could see it. I guess for me, it's like as somebody who's a creator, you're you're always trying to think about what's the next thing, what's the next challenge I'm going to have. Um, it would be nice to kind of be able to do this, you know, I guess, quote unquote, full time. But then you're always again, like, you know, thinking, how else can I be? How, how, how could I be bigger? How can I have more fans? How can I um, create more? So for me, I try to just think of it as like, am I, do I feel I'm, um, I guess like, it, am I proud of the output that I have? You know, do I like the jokes I'm telling? Do I feel like I'm connecting with the community, like my my fans or whoever enough? Um, because, you know, this industry is so fickle that like, that's all you really get, you know, like, at any moment, this could all go away because you just aren't cool anymore, right? But but the uh, the opposite's true too. At any moment, you can just blow the fuck up, and you that's know. so true. That's so true. Right? And so many of my friends have have done that, especially in the pandemic. A lot of my friends. It was so funny. One of my friends, uh, he's this uh, South Asian comic, and I remember literally right at the beginning of the pandemic, he asked me. He's like, "Hey, man." Yo, you got any books I could like read so I can like get into copywriting? Because he was ready to, to quit, and um. In the pandemic, he blew up on TikTok he, and he went on tour and and now he, things are a lot better for him. And he got like, you know, some producer job and stuff like that. So but, you know, he would have been grinding forever and he was ready to call to, to throw it in the towel. Um, and, and like, you know, um, I have uh, a, one of my other friends, Atsuko. She's like a great L.A. comedian. But for I mean, she'd been doing it for like 20 years, dude. And like only after like one or two, like this kind of silly, funny video that she made blew up and now she now she's in a lot of things and it's awesome but again it's like 20 fucking years for you uh, for her to do that um so it, you know like i think you you know i i think a healthy way to think about being a creative or a comedian is like do i enjoy the work and am i enjoying the things that i'm making because as soon as you don't then it's just a job right like now you're just you could be working at like a like a cool place, I guess. But you're, if you're not doing the work you care about, then it's just a it's just a job, just like anything else. You you know you just happen to be doing a creative version of it. So that's what I try to focus on. Because like if any in, in any given moment, I should be quitting. Like like I probably thought about it like this morning. So that's just nat That's just this. That's just how it rolls, you know. And I, I think if you're not thinking about that, you are you are. Well, maybe it's a healthy thing not to think about it all the time, but I think if you're honest with yourself, you know, you, you are thinking like, well, you know, is this the right thing to do? But guys like Ronnie Chang, they got through to where they got because of whatever <laughs> they did, right? Do you ever look at them or try to map out a fast track mm -hmm. and go, what the fuck did they do? Mm -hmm. And how could I do that? Yeah, and then do totally. what they do. But is it replicatable? Is Can you... That's such a good that's such a good question, bro. Um, that's a great great question. I think one thing it helps if you are Australian. No, I'm just kidding. But like, <laughs> <laughs> I will say there is something about being Asian. If you're Asian American, people don't give a fuck. But if you're Asian but have an Australian accent, oh my god, people lose their fucking minds, dude. <laughs> Let me tell you, if if you're British Australian, you got a maid. You know, no, I'm I'm just kidding. But like. Um, I have thought about that. If you look at Ronnie, he's, you know, he is the perfect combination of hard work, 
um, thoughtful in the work that he does do um, and lucky, you know, I mean, he, 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 he blew up. I mean, he worked really hard and he blew up a little bit in Australia. He converted that into like a couple of, uh, he, he got like um, a international student, which is his kind of like, uh, you know, short film or vi- short series that he produced. And then he came here and he got um, daily show, but you know, here's the thing is that, my, you know, what my uh, uh, creative partner for a long time, Fumi, Fumi Abe, who's now in L.A. and he's a writer. Um, he opened for Ronnie uh, when Ronnie was uh, just like a couple years into being um, on The Daily Show. And Ronnie couldn't sell out one club in New York. You know, people came to see him, but they didn't know who he was. They, they came because, oh, oh, it's this kid's on The Daily Show. OK, that's cool. You know, and to think about, you know, uh, Ronnie, he he had been doing really well in Australia, had a, had a TV show in Australia and comes to New York, can't even fill out one uh, club. But a few years later, now he's selling out whole whole theaters over and over and over again all across the country. So it's like, you know, again, it's that the mentality of, um, you know, when when did you make it when do you really make it you know because if i if i were suddenly a daily show correspondent i would be definitely saying like that oh i made it but am i selling tickets oh uh should i be getting on marvel movies you know do i need you know and so um again to go back to ronnie he's he's put all the things in place but there was never a guarantee that this was going to work you know and you know a lot of people put out a lot of different kind of content and um I think that's again all you can do is to as a as a comedian like try to learn new things, be able to do lots of things, you know, not you know, if you have a podcast that's cool, if you can write a pilot that's cool, if you you got stand up, stand up's cool. Um you know, in general nobody pays you for stand up, so it's like that's one of those skills you just kind of keep on the back burner. Um and I have thought about like is there a way to get there faster? I think sometimes Social media has played into a, played into a lot. Like you know, you can go really big on TikTok, which is harder to do now. You oh, know, really? bigger in it, it. It can happen still, but like the pandemic, like picked a couple of people to like really get big. Stevie Ho, um, Stevie Ho, exactly. Stevie Ho, right? Exactly. Um, he's a sweetheart, you know. But like he had, a, you know, he only been doing comedy for like a year. A year. And he was on the he show. Gets, he was on the show a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you know, and uh, but you Killing know, you talk now. to you talk to him, and he still got also get that mentality too. It's like, well, how do I leverage this TikTok into something else? You know, because I, he wants to sell tickets. He, I'm sure he He's wants got to act. The opposite problem as most yeah. people, right? He's yeah. got that following that'll go where he goes. Yeah, and, exactly. But he doesn't have the chops down. He doesn't have the timing. And I've he, seen him live actually. He's really good, but. Yeah. Uh, it still it requires, you know, it's a craft and it requires years in service. Yeah. And he know he knows that, you know, he's a smart guy. So he knows, you know, can you um, turn the, that crowd? How do you essentially monetize that crowd? Right. You know, can you put together an hour and go on tour? Can you uh, turn this into a book? You know, what can you do? Because, um, you know, despite what social media will say, they're not going to really pay you. You know, you, you can't just live off of your TikTok likes and, and that's like zero money. Yeah. So, you know what I'm saying? So uh, there's always something else. Right. You, you, and um, I, I think that there's I, I don't think it's uh, healthy to think, you know, I have to do it this one way, you know, for the vast majority of creators, it's going to take us a long time. And um if we're lucky we get to look back and say it all made sense yeah the things i was doing but at the time i had no idea you know but uh i think i've i've been acquiring the skills and if if one day opportunity strikes i'll be ready you know and i think that's all you can do so yeah makes sense i mean i think the bulk of creative the bulk of artists think that way. You have to. I mean, otherwise, there's no. Can't really look into the future and then connect dots. You know, you can only look backwards and connect dots. Yeah, exactly. I mean, the only other thing I would say is, if possible, be super rich because that will help. Yeah. That always <laughs> if you helps. got rich ass parents, that's amazing. That's the that's the secret. But Mike, I don't I don't know. I don't know if that's a guarantee though, because that's I, true. I talk about this shit on the podcast all the time. It's like if you have rich parents, your muscles 
your ambition muscles atrophy. They just shrink mm. for mm. the most part. I mean, it's yeah. hard to find like it's hard to find like a super wealthy you know kid that's like grinding grinding yeah, yeah. out of control like kids who come up poor yeah that's very true yeah i think it's more like you'll find like a really rich kid who just has like a crazy ass idea and it hits because he's rich <laughs> but yeah, yeah. i see what you're it. saying but yeah you, once you it don't... once it's, if it gets rough then like will they stick it out you know yeah you you don't often find boxers or mma oh UFC no way poor i mean rich no yeah, you know? th those, those, I mean, that's such a hard life that, you know, they either have to, they, they either love it or they ha literally have no other choice. No other choice. Yeah. No other choice than to, like, yeah, sacrifice their own body to do this. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's an awesome sport, which is why it's so cool to watch because you're just like, this guy's literally putting his life on the line for our entertainment. And you're yeah. like, it's like riveting. Yeah. And you, you got to come from a very poor, impoverished totally. background. Too. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When did you start uh, Asians Not Asian? And what, what prompted you to start it? Um, so me and Fumi started maybe, gosh, it's been like a while now, maybe like five years ago. And um, we, maybe even longer now. And, um, you know, he and I did a lot of projects together, just like writing projects just between he and I, because, um, you know, we wanted to do other things. We want to do, this is before TikTok and stuff. So we want to do like funny sketches and we put them out on YouTube. And we like wrote a bunch of different things together. Um, and it was, um, you know, we, we, we came up with this idea for this podcast because like whenever we would write, uh, together, we would sit down and write for the first like hour, we would just like talk shit. We just like talk shit about what it's like being a comedian or talk shit about things that are happening in the scene. And we're like, Hey, we should just like record us talking about this. Mm -hmm. And uh, we thought it was just going to be, you know, whatever, one of all the other different projects that we put out there. And over time, um, we quickly realized that like we were people were listening, um, you know, not a lot of people, but like every month, every week, it got a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And um, yeah, we just kind of like we leveraged the people we knew, you know, we eventually got, you know, some people we knew who were in the scene as well to come on and talk about it. And it's it's been it, it's it's like one of the great blessings that i have uh is to have it and to have people who listen to it and i'm i'm very lucky you know people always email and say this is like one of the things i listen to every week and it's like really cool to to have that because um again for most for many comedians and for many people you know you never it's really hard to get a fan so it's it, every single fan is like massive yeah that's very true. I mean, if you think about singer songwriters or vocalists or people who yes. are in music, you know, it's one chip at a time, one Absolutely. person at a time. You know, but I mean, I think it's like, um, you know, I think if you're a creator, you, you your 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 goal is to not have millions of fans necessarily, but to have maybe a thousand or ten thousand who are like ride or die people who right. are like they fuck with you hardcore. Um, and podcast fans can be like that because you're in their ear so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, I mean, <laughs> uh, I had a show last week on Friday, I had a show and I've been working on it. It was a live show. It was a live version of the podcast. So it was like, kind of like a bunch of games and stuff. And we sold, you know, whatever, almost sold out the, the venue, which is small. It was like, like maybe 90 people. And I was like getting ready for it. And there was like all these people who were there and I just couldn't believe it. I was like, mm. clearly these people are lost. Well, I can't believe they came to see something I'm doing. And it was, it's just wild to, to have people pay money just to see you and the people who are on your show, like just be assholes. <laughs> it's it's terrific, insane. Terrific. It's so, feeling. so crazy. Yeah. Well, congratulations. That's a, you know, it's, it's a milestone you know yeah yeah i try to you know there's plenty of anxiety around what we do so i try to just try to be thankful for those things yeah now who are some of your comedic heroes heroes huh ah <sighs> um i guess i'll start with like the simple question is like who are who do i think of as like being the greatest comedians um so i think the greatest comedian is Chris Rock in actual actually uh he's well for me he is uh his style is so good he is uh his special bigger and blacker is like insane it's so 
it's just like so I, I remember watching it and like it changed my mind about stand up you know like i used to enjoy watching stand up as you know little little sets on the tonight show and now i saw this and i was like this is this is like he was like he was he was like a preacher it wasn't even like comedy it was like he was like preaching um so i think he's great the other person who i really love is like the opposite jim gaffigan he <laughs> is a clean comic but he, he, I've, I've seen him, you know, at, at, at Madison Square Garden. I, I've been lucky enough to see him in a really small venue. And it was great. It was just so like, it's like super technical, actually. It's like he's really, um, it's very clean. So people kind of dismiss it. But every single word is funny that he says. Uh, and he has all these different tools he can use. It's really cool to see. Um, and then, uh, geez, there's like, there's sort of like the people who I think will become legends or are on their way. Roy Wood Jr., who's also on The Daily Show, he's so funny. He's and he, um, you know, he was on my podcast. I was we were lucky enough to have him, and he had he had this really interesting thing. I was like very kind of down on comedy during the pandemic because I was I felt like it wasn't a good a force for good. It was a force for evil. <laughs> and um, he said this really cool thing. He said, uh, "Comedians are like should be like journalists. Journalists and comedians are they're kind of the same." And he came from a very black perspective, right? This very like, you know, as a black comedian, your job is to go and see things and report it and like tell the story. And I thought that was really, really sweet. I thought it was like a like a cool way to think about comedy is to like report on the world. So it like kind of gave me hope. And I and he kind of like reinstilled like that this stupid ass thing we do has value. So um yeah, he's definitely he's definitely like and and, and his he's hysterical. It's like unbelievable. And he's been grinding again also for like 20, 25 years or something. You know who fucking really blew up during the pandemic is Andrew Schultz. Exactly. Yeah. And, oh, okay. I mean, so let's break that down. What were you going to say? No, no, go ahead. I think we're going to so, talk about to talk about the same thing. Yeah. So again, going back to best practices, what the fuck would I do? Blah, 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 blah. What did Ronnie Chang do? What did Andrew Schultz? Is something that Andrew Schultz, what he did... Is that something that you could replicate? Could a comedian look at what he did during the pandemic? He blew up. He became a household name yeah. because of what he did on the internet or during the pandemic. Is that something that anybody could replicate? Or do you think it's really the magic of a Chris Rock or the magic of an Andrew Schultz at the right time, right place, and only that person can do it? I think... I think the lesson anyone should take away from Andrew Souls is don't do what everybody else is doing because he, um, his whole thing was, you know, he was at, first of all, he's very good, right? That's, that's a given. He's very, very good. He's really good at crowd work. Um, and he, he knew that, um, and he had a special and he, um, shopped it around and nobody would buy it. So what did he do? He released it himself. And he put it on YouTube and he kind of built a YouTube thing. And he got big on YouTube before the pandemic. So he like laid, a, you know, it seems oh, like he wow. blew up in the pandemic, but he laid the groundwork before that by oh, going and putting on YouTube. That. We didn't. And like other comedians didn't do that. In fact, most comedians would tell you, don't put your material up on YouTube because material is really hard to generate. And uh, it, it, would it takes a long time. So you don't want to quote unquote burn your material by putting it on you know, on YouTube, except for maybe like one five minute video yeah. so people can see who you are. But Andrew Schultz didn't do that. He put out clip after clip after clip of him. And he, a lot of times he would do crowd work uh, and and or sometimes you just do like a small joke and you just do it on YouTube and again and again. And he had a podcast and he had the whole thing. So he laid all that work down and then he and then he positioned him to get even bigger later on. Um, And, you know, he knows all the right people. So like the practices I think you should take isn't go ahead and put stuff on YouTube. I mean, yes, you can, but to like think what is everybody else doing and how do I do the other thing? Because there's tons of shit on Instagram now. There's tons of shit on TikTok. And again, remember, nobody did that before. Nobody did. People told you not to do it. And there, I've seen it oh, again and again. People say, Man, this is the way to go. This is the way to do it. And then the opposite is true. It, it's always happens. So as like an innovation thing, you know, like do the a thing that everybody says not to do because if they if they knew what to do, they would be famous, right? They would be successful. Yeah. 
but don't listen to the people who are also in the same in the trench with you you know so like that's what i try to think about you know um so i think uh that's the takeaway not so much like the actual different tactics he did those are fine but you know that they, they come with their own problems now what kind of trajectory are you looking for in the near future are you trying to put together just more material and you don't feel comfortable like you have enough shit quality shit yeah. yet and you're putting it together or are you at the point where you're like i got nine hours of shit give me <laughs> somebody give me a fucking special already <laughs> i think for me i would i my kind of vision is because stand-up is such a brutal lifestyle and I have like a small child. So I'm not trying to go on the road and not see my son for like weeks at a time. So I would love to do something where I have like, um, I don't know, almost kind of like a media empire, <laughs> like a small media empire where it's like, I have a couple of podcasts. I have my fans. I have my live shows. And it's like a little ecosystem of like shit that people like about me. You know, I have, I always joke on the podcast. I like, if it was up to me, I would have a podcast about being a dad. I would have a podcast about fashion. I would have a podcast about jujitsu. And then I would have like a, just a general funny podcast, right. Of just hanging out with the boys or, or, or whoever. And, you know, it's like the world of Mike Nguyen, you know? And I think as a, again, a creator, your your thing is like to kind of turn your viewpoint into a bunch of stories that people can go oh yeah i i identify with that i, I fuck with that i'm gonna check that out um and then you know you're just just by being yourself uh you are making money <laughs> so yeah. i think that will be you know I, I don't know how that looks um but i do think i, I think for a while it was just to be funny right or to compile material like you said and i would say in the last year or so especially after doing um opening for ronnie and stuff of like that i know i'm funny i'm funny enough it's fun it's fine could i be funnier i guess but it's not necessarily about the funniest the raw funniest people it's about the person that connects with you the most you know you look at really big comedians who sell out stadiums their joke writing it can be good. Um, there's usually like in an hour long special, you you listen to somebody who's a huge star. They have probably two jokes, which are like really well written. But most of it is just like, I fuck with this person emotionally. Mm, interesting. You know, there's a there's a comedian I love, uh, Young Me Mayer, who is she's a Korean American and she's like mixed race. And she is she has like this whole thing she does. It's a lot of stuff about TikTok like, and she does on TikTok. And it's like she has all these tweets and she, you know, she's like writing all this stuff and it's very her comedy. It's like unlike anything else that's out there, it's like stand up, but also performance. And it's also just her being crazy. And she <laughs> calls herself that. So I'm not calling her crazy. She calls herself this. And it's amazing because she connects with people so deeply, you know, Um and it's not like, I mean, she has a, a lot of followers on, on on Instagram and TikTok, but she doesn't have millions. She doesn't have millions of followers, right. but the people who love her, love her. I mean, I'm talking about like, they would go and they will, they will flip a car over if she told them to, because she, they just like, they fuck with her so much. And I think that's, you know, um, I don't know if I uh, can do that, but I think I have the raw skills you know, available now. I have the, the ability to do that and if I need to. This is very comparable to singing if you think about it, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You, yeah, you could be yes. you could be a a super good singer like at yes. a 10 level, be mm -hmm. very trained and you can kill it and you can deliver, you can hit the high notes, you can do all these proficient like acrobatic shit. But if you are not connecting and if people are yes. like, I don't fuck with him, you yes. can't outperform somebody who's at like level four. You know, yes. like, you know, a lower totally. level, but, but he's putting it out there all pitchy and shit, but people can dig in and connect with him. I mean, think who's the biggest, who are the biggest people? It's, it's Beyonce. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, Taylor Swift and, and they're good musicians for sure. I don't think, you know, but it's not like they're like the most technically good, no. you know, but they put out stuff where people, they listen to it 
and and they and and you think about like with, especially with Beyonce, she's like a she's like a experience, you know. She, her live shows, she puts out documentaries and movies, and she has a world of Beyonce that you can like sink your teeth into. Yeah, and you know um, that uh, I think for a long time, you know, people who are artists they just focus too much on just the the craft and. And the craft is important. I love stand up, but it's like it's not the only thing. It, mm. It's more important that you can connect with another person because once you do, they're your fan forever. You know. Yeah, that makes sense. What about uh, you? Ever fuck with Embarrassed by Night? No, I do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think it's so cool that uh, that they're doing that because, um, you know, you know, you grew up in California, and there's so many Vietnamese people. And whenever I go back to to Orange County. You know, I'm sitting there and and like it's really cool to see this this like next generation of, of kids and they're like they're making really cool pho restaurants and boba places and they're like turning Vietnamese food into something very cool. Um, and I always think, where's the comedy show for these people? Right? There's there's all these young kids and and they grow up. Um, you know, they're on YouTube, they're on TikTok, and they're watching Andrew Schultz. Uh, and they're they're fucking with like um you know, comedy too, uh, hardcore, but there's not a Vietnamese comedy show. Uh, and, and there, you can't say there's not enough Vietnamese people. There's like way too many Vietnamese people in California, but we should have a show. We should have a monthly, at least we should have, right. we probably could do a weekly, you know? And, um, uh, I think, uh, I think what they're doing is, is, is awesome. And, 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 and like, I mean, we make fun of uh, Paris by night, but like, that's like the longest running goddamn variety show yep. in the world, right? Yep. Yep. And every, all of our fa uh, family, uh, you know, we all grew up watching it. And, and even if my parents made fun of it, they they got the fucking mm -hmm. tape. They put that shit a new one out, you know, got to gotta watch it. And um, we have all the ingredients to do like a crazy good comedy ecosystem, a, a comedy world, you know, uh, you know, so it's only a matter of time. And I, again, I'm always surprised that there isn't something like that, especially in California, you know, and not just for Vietnamese people, for like Chinese Americans and fucking Hmong people and all yeah. that shit. Yep, yep. Shout out to Fred Lay over at Embarrassed by Night and Andy Van. Exactly. Over there, those exactly. Guys. Yeah, I've had a few of those guys on. Alex Zung. Um, yeah, it's dudes grinding, Vietnamese guys grinding in the comedy space out here in LA and They've taken the show up to the Bay Area. They've taken mm -hmm. it to Pasadena, to Orange County. You know, I'd be uh, be interesting to take it to New York and bring more Vietnamese comics on board. Yeah, there's um, you know, we got um, two Asian American specific comedy festivals. Uh, one is called um, Asian Comedy Festival, and the other one is called uh, Very Big, Very Asian Comedy Festival, and they happen like within like a month of each other, or like two months of each other. And you would think, oh, is there, is there, is that too many? This is that mentality I was telling you about, like that scarcity mentality. Scarcity oh, oh, is there, is there too many comedy shows? Dude, there's like millions of Asian people in the tri-state area. And we have not even scratched, I would argue, like 1% of the population that it could be interested in this. And a lot of Asian people, I think, I've heard this many times, they didn't go to stand-up shows because usually if you're Asian and you go to a stand-up show you and the community, they cut you. They call you out, and they like they make fun of you or some shit like they that. And it's like it, it's a it's a shit experience. So like, why you know why would you go? But now there's a space for our kind of shit, and we can tell our jokes. And now the white people don't know what we're talking about, and it's great. <laughs> so that you know, it's a uh, it's an underserved population, and uh, it can it can only get better. So you know, um, I'm excited to see what happens. Yeah. Well, Mike, thanks for coming on today, man. It was a pleasure to talk to you. And I hope in the next few years, we'll get you back on and shoot the shit. You know, when, if you're ever out in LA, please hit me up, Fred up, and we'll all go get some dinner or something. Dude, let's do it. Let's do it. Uh, I love it. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for having me on. And, and uh, everybody check out my podcast, Asian on Asian, or follow me on Instagram. Nice pants, bro, is my handle. Then I've seen a, a few of those. I've seen a lot of your Instagram um the, the 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 ones that you do it's really funny stuff oh thank you thank you yeah once again well where, asians not asian on yeah. spotify or apple podcast and uh it's a it's, yeah it's a asian not asian it's on everything it's on you know all the different uh, platforms you, we're on youtube as well 
Uh, and then on Instagram, uh, my personal handle is nice pants, bro. It's a long story, but yeah, you can check me out and, um, and come, come check me out in New York city. I do stand up all the fucking time, uh, here and yeah, Next time love, I'm out there, hang out. Up. please do. All right, Mike, have a great night. And thanks again for coming on. Thank you for listening to the Vietnamese with Kenneth Nguyen. The Vietnamese is produced by Brittany Tran. Special thanks to Jane Nguyen, Catherine Nguyen, Tina Pham, Sydney Jamie, and Christo Trin. Please find us on Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok at The Vietnamese Podcast. You can also find us on YouTube where you can subscribe, like, and comment. Please rate and give us a review wherever you find our podcasts.